When I was younger, I was told that over 70% of the Earth's surface was covered in water. Can you believe that? 70% of the planet we call ours is home to the biggest and most diverse biome in the world. Growing up, I always thought it was crazy that creatures like this and this are able to exist in some of the deepest parts of the ocean, like in the Mariana Trench, almost 11,000 meters below the surface. Able to survive under pressures that are unimaginable for humans. I mean, I put my head under the water for like a minute and I get a headache. It's crazy. The ocean is a terrifyingly astonishing place. But as I gradually come of age, it terrifies me. It terrifies me to discover that the number of ocean dead zones has increased dramatically over the past half century. And for those of you who are unaware, ocean dead zones are little parts in the ocean that are oxygen deprived due to human induced nutrient pollution. These places are so low in oxygen that they're, not, they're, they're no longer able to support most marine life underwater. Yeah. It breaks your heart, doesn't it? It breaks my heart to discover that the Great Barrier Reef, the world's biggest coral reef system, is dying due to coral bleaching, yet another dirty consequence of what we're doing to our beloved planet. All of you need to understand that global warming isn't something we're foreseeing anymore. The globe has already warmed. The ocean is already dying. Our best hope right now is to try and figure out ways to reverse the damage that's already been done. I want you all to ask yourselves, am I really doing the best that I can to help? And your answer is going to be either one of two things, either no, in which case, thank you for your honesty, I'll get to that in a bit, or yes, in which case, well, I hate to break it to you, but that's probably not the right answer. And I know what some of you are thinking, well, hey, I recycle, I drive a hybrid, I take short, quick showers, I ride a bicycle to school every day, and that's fine, don't get me wrong, if you're doing that, that's great, keep doing it, you are making a positive change, but I ask you to just look into it a bit more. And I'll explain, but first I want to take a quick survey, if you guys don't mind. How many of you here have had a burger in the last, say, month or so? A beef burger. That's right, that's a lot of people. Me too. I've, I've had a couple of burgers, actually, in the last month. I really like burgers. They're delicious. But what if I told you that it takes 3,000 liters of water to make one burger? One beef burger. To put that into perspective, this is how much water the average human drinks every single month. That's 18 liters of water. By eating that burger, you just wasted about 167 times the amount of water you're drinking on average per month. Like, I'm not trying to... I mean, talk about unsustainability. Here's some more crazy facts. 55% of all the water in the United States alone is used to raise animals. Also, only 5% is used for domestic purposes. And on the global scale, about a third of the entire world, world's freshwater reserve is used for the meat and dairy industry. Yeah. And hey, I'm not trying to shame all of you here for enjoying that burger. Nor am I trying to tell you that burgers are our main problem and that we should stop eating burgers and that's full stop. All I'm trying to prove here today is that with a little reconsideration to our diets and our lifestyles as Arabs and as residents of this country, we could maybe someday wake up to a slightly less blazing hot UAE. Perhaps a toaster instead of a blazing hot burger. So why? Why is it that most people to this day are still under the interpretation that fossil fuels are the main cause of global warming? 
Well, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations put it one way, saying that the direct warming impact is highest for carbon dioxide simply because its concentration and the emitted quantities are much higher than that of the other gases. And this is pretty accurate. The tropospheric concentration of carbon dioxide in, that, in our atmosphere is at around 382 parts per million. That's a lot of carbon dioxide. But the misconception arises when the actual effects of these lingering greenhouse gases in our atmosphere are scantily discussed. Take methane, for example, a very commonly heard of greenhouse gas. I'm sure a lot of you here know about methane, pretty cool greenhouse gas. Uh, second most concentrated, actually, at around seven, just over 1,700 parts per billion in our atmosphere. Methane is actually commonly produced by most animals during their digestive process. Animal parts, to be specific. But what I'm sure a lot of you here aren't aware of is that methane is actually 21 times more effective in trapping heat in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. How about nitrous oxide? Third most concentrated, and it's actually mainly produced by none other than you guessed it, cow poop. <laughs> Animal manure. 65% of all nitrous oxide emissions are thanks to animal manure. Kind of gross, isn't it? That's the air you're breathing. Lost my train of thought. 65% of that is animal manure. <laughs> so I guess what I guess I guess we can all agree, I guess what we can all agree upon is that carbon dioxide is really the most concentrated greenhouse gas in our atmosphere rather than the most detrimental. And that secondary greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide deserve a lot more of our attention because they can be a lot more destructive. And this brings me to my next point. Animal agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, this next figure is a little disturbing, to say the least. Humans farm and consume over 56 billion animals every single year. Let that number sink in for a little. 56 billion. There are so many animals on this planet that they have to take up 45% of the entire land on Earth. 45%. They're responsible for 91% of Amazon rainforest destruction. And on top of that, they like to poop. A lot. They really like to poop. Millions upon millions of kilograms of animal excrement are produced every single minute. And animal excrement releases nitrous <coughs> oxide in the air, which I'm pleasantly informing you is 296 times more destructive than carbon dioxide. Not much, is it? I'm sure a lot of you aren't even aware, and it really goes to show how misinformed we are, because I'm sure a lot of you aren't even aware that animal agriculture accounts for, 50, for up to 51% of all greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. That's more than all the emissions released by cars, trucks, planes, and ships combined. And nobody's doing anything about it. Well, maybe these fellows. Um, these are called vegans. <laughs> uh, they're really pompous and they like to rub it in your face that uh, they're a lot healthier and are going to live a lot longer than you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't like them either. I mean, look, I'm not going to stand here and try and convince all of you in a country like this that vegan is the way to go, especially when this kind of food exists in this country. So. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's possible. In fact, I myself don't believe that going fully vegan is the right way. But I do believe that just like we've taught our children to conserve water by turning off the faucet when they're brushing their teeth in the morning, to conserve electricity by switching off the lights when they're not in the room, by trying to prevent pollution by using the bicycle, riding the bicycle to school every day, I think we can make a lot of repair 
to our already broken atmosphere, to our already broken planet, our already dying ocean, if we just taught our children the value of eating food. I think it's absolutely crucial. I mean, years ago, 80% of the, human, of the average human being's diet was made out of vegetables. And these people, without a doubt, understood the value of, meat, of, of eating food. They understood the luxury of eating. And that's why I believe if we teach our children the true value of eating, conserve, teaching them to conserve their eating habits, conserve their diets, we can do a lot for this planet. We can save our oceans. And we can save our dying Great Barrier Reef. People need to be informed about the true culprit behind global warming. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just been informed of the true culprit behind global warming. Thank you very much.